to Lent and welcome to Sim. I hope you're as excited as I am about this. Um, and uh, so the way it happened was a couple of us at uh, the Adult Formation Committee were sitting around um, wondering what to do for Lent and um, we just kind of got on a roll and went with it that many of us have been raised with really abusive and hurtful understandings of what sin is. Many of us have been raised without church at all, and so it's, well, all we get is what's floating around in the culture. Many of us have been raised or exposed to um, kind of the more therapeutic, uh, pop therapeutic model that says, oh, there's really no such thing as sin, it's just little mistakes or big mistakes, and it, you know, just look within your heart and everything will be fine. And none of those are really theologically or spiritually um, adequate for, for us. None of them really tell us what is broken and why and what's our place in that story. Um, and so we decided to do a series on that. So Brennan is going to give us some insight on the scriptural understanding of sin. And then the next two weeks will be me um, talking about, next week we'll talk about um, major early figures, basically from Augustine to Anselm. So that's about the first thousand years or so um, of the Christian era. And then um, the following week we'll talk about um, Reformation theologies and liberation theologies. And, Really, all of this with an imp with an eye to how it impacts our culture today, because I want us to see how we got to where we got. Then Sharon is going to talk with us three weeks from now on the sacramental reckoning with sin. So how do baptism, how does the Eucharist, and how does the um, rite of reconciliation of a penitent um, help us liturgically and pastorally and on a community level um, to place our insight into sin in, a, in the context of worship and in the context of um, the story, the broad liturgical story of the people of God. And the last week, um, we have two ideas. I think we decided to go with the workshop, with the workshop idea. So um, what if we... I'm not yeah, I think, I think, I think the, the idea is that we will talk with each other and maybe in small groups, but also share broadly. No, about, no, no. About, <laughs> but about what we think about sin, but also uh, what are some things. I mean, uh, we don't have to reveal stuff about ourselves that we don't want to talk about, but uh, but even systemically, like culturally, like what are some of the ways that we see sin at work in the world based on some of the stuff that we learn, and are there anything we can do about it? So. Yeah. And the story of sin is the story of grace and mercy. So we'll just, that's, that's a major theme for us. Um, and then it'll be Palm Sunday. And I guess before Brennan uh, does his thing, I just want to say that if during Lent especially, or at any time, um, there's something that is uh, weighing you down in your thoughts around sin in your own life, I would really urge you to take advantage of the, the uh, right that is in the Book of Common Prayer it is part of our community life that we can do individually, usually with a, a priest, to have a one-on-one -on -one liturgical moment with them to, to, to go through that, and um, that's available to you. So Sharon will talk about it in a couple weeks, but you know if she tries, if she and Ben will try to do a, a, a thousand you know confessions in two weeks. That, I'm sure they're ready for it, but, <laughs> but anyway, just read through that in the, in the prayer book and see if that speaks to you. All right, so let's take it away with yeah. sin. All right, well, the Lord be with you. Awesome. Let's pray. God, thanks for this time for us to talk and think and reflect about uh, how your scriptures talk to us about uh, problems of disorder, of, uh, of hatred, of, um, of the deep loss of life that we can feel even in the past week, uh, the problems that, uh, that we can place under the name sin. We pray that you'd help us to have boldness and courage to understand how the world actually is and to not turn away from the problems that we see, but also give us hope that the word of death is not the last word and that sin does not control us. Amen. All right, so, uh, yeah, as, as Shirley pointed out, uh, this uh, whole 
five-week series is about sin, um, and part of it, too, is that we're leading up to Easter, uh, and so this will get us into the mood of Good Friday, right? Uh, uh, what is it that Jesus does on the cross, and how does, how does that do anything at all? Um, and so uh, in order to explore that problem, we do need to talk about what, what, what went wrong with the world. Um, so uh, like Charlie said, too, the uh, <laughs> sin has often been used uh, in ways that are... Oh, really problematic um, that uh, sin is attached to individual people and particular things they do that are sort of culturally inappropriate according to certain folks. Um, so people focus on things like sex uh, or people focus on um, uh, sort of particular actions that people uh, uh, participate in and then call the whole person a sinner. It's almost the same way that some people who are undocumented in this country are called illegal aliens as if everything they do in their whole self is illegal. Uh, so the sinner, right, uh, is uh, oftentimes used as a way to try to hurt people. And we all know, um, uh, you know, a lot of people think it all goes back to sex and that there's some sort of shame. This is a, ca a Christian catacomb uh, image uh, of Adam and Eve and uh, the tree and sort of covering up their genitalia. There's something, something especially about sex that's been used as clobber passages, um, trying to hurt people. Uh, and these, you know, there are a few passages in the Bible uh, that people use over and over again to try to hurt folks. I mean, someday we'll have a, maybe, maybe we'll talk about sex in the Bible, um, and there's a completely different way to read it, at least in my mind, all of those passages um, that don't end up clobbering anybody. But um, in any event, uh, the, the alternative to sin is oftentimes just kind of feel good therapeutic Christianity. Uh, Joel Osteen, the kind of champion of this kind of Christianity. You can't have a blessed day thinking about who offended you and what didn't work out. Think on the positive things. You know, just don't think about bad things, mean things, angry things. Just only think about good things. Um, which, you know, might be good in terms of like the next five minutes, you know, just uh, to, if you need to cool down, maybe you forget like somebody who offended you. But uh, in the big scheme of things, um, this is just a uh, quietism. It's just a way for you to, to not be involved in the world um, and not actually try to change anything for the better. It's a way to just say, <clears throat> if there are problems, then I'm just going to accept them. Uh, another big problem for people who want to talk about sin is Buddy Jesus, right? You know, Jesus doesn't want to talk about anything that's like kind of would make anyone uncomfortable. He's just happy. He's nice, right? You know? Big thumbs up to everyone and everything, right? But uh, but the problem is, is that um, we live in a world and we're you know constantly aware of this, although we try to pretend otherwise sometimes. Um, at least in the past year, uh, you know, I mean, we, we see constantly um, uh, images on TV and things like this. We have 18 school shootings in the last you know few weeks of, of this year. Um, there is violence and disruption and, and really evil that we can see all around us in the world, and this is something that we can't ignore. And as Christians, what is what, what do we have to say to this? Um, do we just say God loves us? I mean, 18 school shootings in one year in the United States. Um, what do we say to the victims of that? Or is there anything that our faith can tell us about what the real problem is? Um, of course, we need gun legislation and so on, but there are also some, some big systemic problems that even go beyond just the idea of guns. Um, what's actually wrong with, the, with our world that people want to do this? Um, so we'll t spend this day talking about uh, how s sin, this kind of name for this problem, this disorder in the world, um, what what's actually in the Bible, and then also what, what people think is in the Bible, but might, might not be. Um, and so we'll spend some time in the Old Testament and some time in the New Testament, um, uh, and and we'll actually get a get a chance to t to talk about uh, Adam and Eve, which I've um, tried to talk about a few times, but we keep having to run past it. But in any event, so. If you turn with me in your Bibles to the very, very beginning, Genesis 1, first chapter, first verse, um, <clears throat> we've already talked about this a couple times last year uh, with incarnation and so on, um, but the big point to me about Genesis 1, the first creation story, if there's one thing that's repeated in this text that you know again and again, is that God said it was good, good. right, the, the creation is good, the stuff is good, the world is good, in part because it's ordered well. God has ordered things well. Genesis 1 is very concerned that like things have a place, everything that's made has a place for it. God makes places, seas, skies, ground, and then God populates those places with things that are appropriate to it. Everything's got a place, everything's in order, everything's balanced, it's great. Other ancient Near Eastern creation stories, we've talked about this last year, were based on chaos and disorder. And there's a God that has to jump into the mix and violently kill the chaos monster and create order. And what's crazy about Genesis 1 is that there's no chaos monster. So in comparison to the other it sound, looks a lot like an ancient Eastern creation myth, except it, there's this absence of evil at the very beginning of it, or chaos. So where'd the chaos come from that we know is a part of our lives? Well, in the ancient Near East, the problem was demons. Uh, demons were the cause of problems. There's evil spirits that kind of existed after the destruction of the original chaos monster, right? There's just this kind of force of 
you know, disruption and maybe you can say evil that, that just kind of exists in the universe and there's good gods and, and that try to help you and even they might mess up from time to time, but you know, sort of like benevolent gods or more or less benevolent gods. And then there's kind of more or less uh, evil gods or whatever divine beings are trying to get you. And like the whole world is kind of this battle place um, and you're trying to be sort of helping the, the good gods like you and, and, and you know, appreciate you. That's why you sacrifice and so on. So the, uh, your place in the world is in the midst of a cosmic battle. Well, the way that Genesis begins, it doesn't look like the world is a cosmic battle place. And actually, if you read the Old Testament, there's very few references to any like evil spiritual powers. So where is the evil? Where's the disorder? Where does it come from? God didn't create it in the, the, the world is whole, all created good. It's all balanced in order. There's no chaos monster. Oh wait, there are some chaos monsters. They're people. <laughs> We're the chaos monsters. We're the disordered beings in creation, according to the Old Testament. <laughs> and we'll get to this a couple different ways, but the, 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 the Bible is over and over again says actually people are really the root problem of things in the universe. <laughs> yeah, and we're, we are. And why is that though? And the Old Testament actually has several different ways of getting at this. In Genesis 2 and 3, which is a separate creation story from Genesis 1, but was edited together at a later date, um, it, it presents uh, really a, what we might call a, an anthropology, right? You know, a way of thinking about how, how the human being is and how it functions. Like, what, what are humans? So. Genesis 2. If you turn with me to Genesis 2 then, we'll talk about uh, uh, many Christians read this and think, and, uh, uh, you know, there's the snake, that's Satan, and there's an apple, right? Uh, neither of those things are actually in the text, as we'll see. Um, uh, there is a serpent, but it doesn't look like it's Satan, at least if you just read Genesis uh, 3 in light of uh, ancient Eastern uh, backgrounds. So, Genesis 2, verse 4b, in the middle of verse 4, you can see there's probably a little division in your, in your Bible, a little like white space that was created by the editors. Um, and it starts, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens when no planet of the field was yet in the earth. This is the beginning of that second creation story, the one that spends more time thinking about humans. The first one says humans are created in God's image and it's all good. Um, the second one says, well, why, why isn't it still good? Um, so then verse seven, if you skip down there. So then the Lord God formed human from the dust of the ground. And by the way, that is always translated man, but it's not, it's not man, it's ha'adam, like the, the human thing. The, the earthling is a way to translate this. So it's, it's, doesn't, it's not quite gendered yet. Um, from the dust of the ground, and God breathed into its nostrils the breath of life, and the human became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and then God put the human, the God formed out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that's pleasant. So God makes the trees after the humans. In Genesis 2, it's different from Genesis 1, where the trees come first, but whatever. Um, so then you have this whole thing about like uh, where sort of where this garden is, uh, and then Verse 18, God says to the human, it's not good that the human should be alone. I'll make a helper as a partner. Helper is also a bad translation. Um, this is like when, when people are in suffering and they in the Psalms and they, they, someone's attacking them and they call out to God, God be my helper, like save me, like come with a sword, like, you know, fight, like defend me. That's that word helper. Um, this doesn't mean like, you know, do the dishes, right? Which is how it's often translated, right? Like, you know, a subservient role, like this is the creation of woman uh, uh, in, in especially Christian interpretation. Um, and that this, this is some sort of genetic subservience um, to, to men as a helper. Um, this word, uh, I mean, should be like defender, um, like valiant defender. This is again, God coming to help you when you're like, when you're in great need. Um, so in any event, uh, I'm gonna make this valiant creature as his partner. Um, so anyway, out of the ground, uh, the Lord God formed every animal. So wait a minute. God said the human needs a partner and then God made the animals. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not, that's not the answer, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, basically the human gives them names and then the human's like, well, none of these are very good, right? But what's this, the presupposition there? What are we? We're animals. Yeah, we're animals. God made other animals to be our partners, but there was something not quite right. So God decided to kind of split the human in two and make a second human, and then there's gendered, man and woman, uh, in verse 22. Um, so in any event, gender kind of comes after the creation of the human in Genesis 2, um, but also there's this kind of creation to, to, to animals. Um, it doesn't quite, like, there's something a little bit different about us and animals, but still, that's, that's pretty much... When God thinks about partners for us, that's almost there. Um, so then, uh, uh, verse 25, the man and his wife are both naked and were not ashamed. Uh, this had, doesn't have much to do with sex at all. It's just that they, um, they're they kind of uh, unoblivious, right? Your dog 
is not embarrassed when they walk out in public and, and are naked. This is another way of saying that your dog is not self-reflective. Your cat is not self Your cat doesn't get embarrassed if they try to jump somewhere and like they miss. They don't like look around and be like, oh, you know, and then try to do it again to be cool. Like, isn't that kind of strange? Like, if you think about this, like if you take a dog and you put the dog in the middle of the opera, like and just let it run around, it will not feel out of place. But if I go to the opera, I feel out of place. Why is this that human beings feel out of place? Well, according to Genesis 2, we didn't start out that way. We didn't start out self-reflective, embarrassed about who we are, where we are, where we're supposed to be, and so on. That's something we developed or grew or learned. So, in any event, we started out like animals, totally fine wherever we are, just happy, you know? And then, well, I mean, maybe dogs aren't always happy, but, you know, it doesn't take much for a dog to be happy, right? I mean, I'll, like, step on my dog's foot, and my dog will be like, Meow! and then, like, my dog's, like, walking after me. It's like... Everything's cool. <laughs> like if someone steps on my foot, I'm like, damn. You know? So, anyway, uh, animal, uh, so, but then verse three, uh, chapter three, verse one, sorry, starts out, now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. That word crafty is a rhyme with the word naked. Arom and arum. So it's a play on words there. We, are na we were naked, like we just, you know, we weren't complicated creatures and so on, but this, there's this one thing in creation that, like, is crafty. And that's not a bad word necessarily. It's the same word you'd use to talk about in Hebrew. To talk about someone who knows how to make stuff, how to build stuff. They're crafty. They're they're wise. Like they're just they're good at doing stuff. So this there's one thing in creation here, the serpent, that just has a little more, I don't know, like mental acuity. It just it's it knows how to do stuff. So it doesn't mean tricky. Doesn't mean tricky. Yeah, it can every once in a while, but it's gener almost always a very positive thing to say about someone in Hebrew. There are room there. Like I would say that about my, my father-in-law, who can just make all kinds of stuff. He just loves to build stuff. That's so crafty. Bill Graves, for example. Yes, crafty. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so not not evil. This is not a negative word. So the serpent is more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. And this serpent comes and says to the woman, "Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden?" So God had already given this uh, uh, provision. Uh, don't, you know, so if you go back to chapter 2, verse 15, it's actually worth to check it out. Uh, so chapter 2, verse 15, Lord God took the human, put this human in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it, and the Lord God commanded the human, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, from the day you eat of it you shall die. So there's something about knowing the difference between good and evil. This might be also the same thing that tells me maybe when I'm in the opera that like, some, I, sh I should be dressed, I should look, I should act a certain way. way. That kind of self-reflectiveness, right? My dog doesn't know the difference between like ethics about good and evil. My, my dog tries to be like nice to me because I feed my dog, whatever. But like, you know, uh, it's, there, there's no like a self-reflection on whether or not something is good or bad, right? So in any event, we just were like that. So this serpent, who's a little bit more mental acuity, comes up to the woman and says, hey, did God really say don't eat from any tree? And of course, uh, that's not true. The woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, don't eat the fruit of the trees in the middle of the garden. Don't touch it also, or you'll die. So the woman adds a little bit of like a little additional uh, command there that wasn't actually in chapter two. But the serpent said to the woman, well, you're not gonna die because God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God knowing both good and evil, which is kind of true and not true. The people end up dying, not that day. So the day you eat of it, you shall die, God says. The servant's like, no, you won't eat it. You won't die today, right? You know, there's a little bit of wiggle room in that, in that, uh, in that provision there. The servant's technically correct, also technically incorrect. Sort of a, what is that, politifact, like half truth, you know? Um, but the day that you, your eyes will be open, you will be like God. You won't be God, but you'll be like God because you'll know good and evil. So the woman saw the tree was good for food. By the way, it doesn't say apple anywhere. That comes from a rhyme, like a joke in Latin, that uh, malum and malum, like bad, evil, is like a rhyming word with apple. So Augustine makes that up, or maybe borrows it from people who've been already using it in Latin. But anyway, this, it just says fruit, nondescript. Like, so there's a, there's a tree in the middle of the garden that has some fruit on it that apparently like gives you the knowledge of good and evil. That is the ability to tell the difference between good and bad. That is, am I doing the right thing or not? So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, the light to the eyes, it looked good, looked nice, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Uh, by the way, this all gets put on Eve, but like, Adam's literally right there. <laughs> the entire, the whole conversation is happening, Adam's literally right, like next to, like, so, you know, who, who was also there. He's just like a bump on a log looking. So in any event, uh, men use this to say that women are terrible and evil and so on. It's like, yeah, the, 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 the,
all of humanity is involved in this uh, conversation. So then the eyes of both were open and they knew they were naked. So the first thing that happens is they get that self-reflective thing. They start to worry about where they are, what they look like. Is this right? Is this good? And so on. Start to get a little ashamed of maybe themselves, right? So uh, then uh, they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths themselves, and they start to cover themselves. Um, this isn't necessarily about sexuality. I mean, I guess a little bit, but it's really just about like a propriety. Like, like do are we are we fitting in here? So uh, in any event, then God, you know, sort of walking around in the garden. This is you know imagining God kind of as a human being and in, in the form of a human being walking around at the time of the evening breeze. God's enjoying the evening walk with the dog. And the man and his wife uh, uh, hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh, God, among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God, that is the name, the particular name Yahweh, the God, uh, called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, hey, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from that tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And he said, no, 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 it was her, right? She gave it to me and I ate. And then God said, what did you do? And she said, oh no, it was that serpent. It tricked me. <laughs> and so then God gets mad at the serpent and so on. And there's this kind of cursing language, um, which uh, there's a discussion, I don't have time to go into this in too much detail, but there's a lot of discussion in Christian and Jewish interpretation about whether these are prescriptive or descriptive. That is, did God like punish the people by saying these things, or is this a recognition that there's a new reality that happens because of this? So. In any event, the, the thing that seems to change a lot uh, is that humans get this ability to be self-reflective. This is something that is said to be in the Bible, like sort of the property of the gods. It's a divine thing. But there's a problem now, and the problem, the way Genesis talks about it is not original sin. It's not that everyone afterwards will be born inheriting a condition called sin, or that's not, sin's not even in Genesis 3. That word is not even here. The issue seems to be that human nature has been changed in some way that is not necessarily all bad, but brings with it some consequences. So uh, my professor, my, my Dr. Mutter, um, my advisor at Emory, uh, Carol Newsom, she has a great article where she uh, talks about um, this, about Genesis 3, and she says what it really looks like is, uh, human beings eat this fruit of the apple or whatever, the, 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 the you know, this, fruit on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what they get is uh, sort of divine knowledge, but they're still human beings, they're still animals. And so in a way, it's kind of like divine operating system is trying to work on like animal hardware, and there's dysfunction that happens. So what happens is not just all negative though, it's also like, it's the reason you feel awkward walking into the opera, it's also the reason that like you can think about like how to help someone else that you don't even know. It's the reason that you can also think about hurting someone you don't even know. So what happens is that we become like the gods, not, not in our ability to control ourselves, but in our ability to do things that we sometimes can't control. So in other words, all art comes from this, all creation. Notice that the people make stuff only after they've eaten from the garden, uh, from, the, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They make loincloths, they like make clothes right after this. And then Genesis 4 and 5, they make art, they make music, they make cities. The creation of culture, which animals don't really have to some degrees, maybe minimally, but like humans distinguish themselves by their culture, by our ornate languages, our mythologies, our stories, our art, our music, and so on. And this is all possible, but it's the same exact thing that gives us the ability to hurt others. So this is, Genesis 3 isn't about original sin necessarily, it's about the possibility of sin. That is the possibility of us to disorder the world, but also to reorder it. This tremendous power that humans have. So does that make sense, kind of the mythological aspects of Genesis 3, but it's explaining like, why are we different? Why are we kind of like animals, but we, we were different too? Why do we have this sense in us that we should be doing right and we don't do it, that my dog doesn't have? So in any event, uh, Genesis 4, is the first mention of sin. And this is, of course, the story of Cain and Abel. So there are two children born, Cain and Abel, and they do two different things. Verse two, uh, so Eve bears uh, Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to Yahweh an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel brought for his part the first leaves of his flock, their fat portions. So they bring like basically their fruit. People have pointed out like, Maybe God really likes, uh, I don't know, flock and God hates like grain or something. 
That doesn't seem to be actually at issue here. If it was, God would have talked about it. Instead, there's just this weird but unexplained problem that God accepts one offering but not the other. So God had regard for Abel and his offering, verse 5, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. Why does God not like Cain's stuff? I don't know. It doesn't explain. The problem, I don't think, is the particulars. The problem is the issue of like what happens when good things happen to someone else and not you. What do you feel? Jealousy, right? And then you oftentimes want to evil, even the playing field, right? So uh, Cain takes this into his own hands. Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. When bad stuff happens to you and good stuff happens to other people, what do you do about it? Well, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance falling? Hey, if you do well, won't you be accepted? If you don't do well, sin is lurking at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. It's this new thing that's popped into the world, this potential to do evil. In other words, like you can do good or you can do evil is what God's trying to teach Cain. Like that's in your power now. But also sin is like this thing. What is it doing? It's lurking at your door. There's this ability to hurt others and to destroy your relationship with God, with other people, with yourself even, that you can always do. But also you can choose to do other things as well. You can choose to do well or you can choose to do evil. So then Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the field. When they're out in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. He chooses the bad, right? Sin lurked at his door and got a hold of him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? He says, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? So he killed his brother. God says, where's your brother? He says, I don't know. I don't even care. Like, am I supposed to take, take care of him? And I think the it's unanswered, but the answer to that question is, yes, you are your brother's keeper. You are your sister's keeper. You are the keeper of all of your neighbors, which is everyone. So then God says, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened his mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Notice that God doesn't say, I am cursing you. God says, you are cursed. There is a curse of sin that God doesn't like throw at people as a punishment, like lightning bolts from Zeus. Sin is a condition that comes out of the ground because humans have started to create disorder. It's a natural consequence of the way that we live. So this disorder uh, has not just disordered uh, like kind of God's relationship with Cain. God says to Cain, now you gotta wander the earth. You're gonna have problems with other people. You're gonna have problems with yourself. You're not even gonna like, be able to be at home yourself. So God gives kind of a modicum of uh, protection to Cain, but Cain's going to suffer for the rest of his life because of this. So I think this is the actual description of like the origins. This is the original sin in a way. Um, it doesn't work like original sin in Christian theology, but nonetheless, according to Genesis, like we all participate in this, not because we inherited it from Cain in a way or something like that, but because we inherited from the first humans this ability to do good and evil, and eventually all of us, sometimes at least, choose the bad. It's within our power and we do it. We know we shouldn't, though. We're aware that like, we should master this thing. So what do we do about it? The Old Testament has a way to deal with this. Is it just, does everything just stink then? <laughs> is there no help, hope for you? Well, according to the Old Testament, yes, there is hope. And where do you get that hope? At the altar. So the whole book of Leviticus, much of, much of Numbers, uh, bits of Deuteronomy, those are all ritual, and a lot of Exodus, those are all ritual texts. Now. Uh, a lot of Christians look at this part of the Old Testament and they say that's all Jewish ritual stuff and it's terrible and it's bad and I don't want to even know about it. Well, mm -hmm. for the early church, this was hugely important. The whole book of Hebrews is all about how like, Jesus is kind of like participating in this cultic stuff. Um, the whole reason that Jesus dies is because of this stuff. So in other words, this stuff is important to Christians. and should, we, we should think about how priests work in the Old Testament and so on. Jesus is called a high priest. We, we conduct a, a Eucharistic service that is based upon ancient covenant rituals of the ancient Near East, which is all tied up with this stuff. So in other words, this stuff in Leviticus isn't just stuff for us to laugh at or say like, uh, you can't wear like clothes with two kinds of yarn in it and so it's stupid, whatever. Um, but there, or you can't eat lobsters and so it's stupid, right? There's, there's a lot of really, uh, I think, liturgically, theologically rich stuff in here, uh, but also that helps us um, understand ourselves. I won't make you read Leviticus. Well, let's turn actually. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. What's that? Where? To Leviticus chapter 4. So Genesis, then Exodus, then Leviticus. So third book of the Bible, Leviticus chapter 4. So the whole book of Leviticus is a priestly manual. 
It's a manual to tell priests how to do sacrifices. Now, why, why, do, why do ancient Israelites do sacrifices? Well, uh, in large part, it's because uh, every ancient Eastern person does sacrifices, animal sacrifice. Every single culture does it. I don't think God does animal sacrifices because ne necessarily does a whole lot of good in and on itself, but it's something that everyone understands. It's a symbol that matters to everyone in the ancient world, so Israel participates in that culture. They are ancient Eastern people. Just like every ancient Eastern culture has prophets, Israel has prophets. Every ancient Eastern culture has laments, Israel has laments. But it's what they do with these things that are common in the ancient East that is unusual, distinct, important theologically. So every ancient Eastern culture, culture has, has animal sacrifice. If you look at ancient Babylon, they have a, a key to ritual. We have the kind of script for this ritual so we can see how it works. Uh, and what they do is they sacrifice animals and they take the blood from the animals and they clean, they kind of scrub their, their, their temples with it, which is kind of gross because blood is kind of nasty and you know smells after a while. Right, right, but it's, so it doesn't cleanse it uh, microbiologically, right? Um, it doesn't actually clean anything in terms of dirtiness. It makes everything more dirty. What it cleans is kind of spiritual infection. So again, blood in the ancient world is powerful cleansing stuff that gets rid of, for all other ancient Eastern peoples, demons, evil powers, evil spirits. You wash your temple with this and it makes all the demons leave. It's apotropaic, it's like, a, you know, the exorcist kind of stuff, right? Well, ancient Israel, in the book of Leviticus, they talk a lot about taking the blood of animals and cleaning stuff with it too in the temple. But it's an entirely different way of understanding what that means and how it works. In ancient Israel, demons aren't mentioned in Leviticus outside of like one reference to Azazel in the, the, the Day of Atonement, but that like, it's like the book is like, and there's this thing, Azazel, okay, now let's go over here. They, like, they don't want to talk about it. The reason they don't want to talk about it is they don't want ancient Israelites to blame their problems on demons like everyone else does. Remember in ancient Israel, who's the chaos monsters? Yeah. We are, yeah, me, right? So where does sin come from in ancient Israel? Us, which means when we clean the temple, we're cleaning our mess that we made. Not, we're not exercising demons. So if you turn to the book of Leviticus chapter four, these are the sin offerings. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, when anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about things not to be done, it does any one of them. These are unintentional sins. What if you do an intentional sin? What if you do something you mean to do it? There, uh, there are some pr provisions in Leviticus for like transferring intentional sins to unintentional sins, and you have to repent of it publicly and repay, like make, make good on what went wrong. In other words, you have to like fix the actual physical material problems that you've created, and then you can like make right with God. So first you do that publicly, that's part of the sin ritual. That is, the ancient Israelites recognize that sin has a public dimension a corporate dimension, maybe even we can say systemic dimension. There's an entire system-wide problem, and people have to try to make physical efforts, actual material efforts to change the things of the world, to make right what we've done wrong. And then you have to take do something with God. And there's this ritual. Verse three, if it is the anointed priest who sins. So you kind of start with the priests, and then you have like, like nobles, and you have regular people. And they do this, this different thing, because based on your status in society, you bring different kind of price animals. So poor people can bring things like doves. And if you remember the beginning of Luke, when Jesus' parents go to the temple, they bring a couple of doves, which means Jesus is poor, his family's poor. So anyway, you, it's a staggered, it's like a sliding scale of taxes or whatever, you know, but these aren't really taxes, but you know, sliding scale of offerings. Um, so uh, if, someone, if, someone's, if the priest sins and brings guilt on the people, he shall offer the sin that he has committed for this, a bull of the herd without blemish is a sin offering to Yahweh. He shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of the meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the head of the bull. So notice you lay your hand and you say, this is, I did wrong. I'm giving this to make up for it in some way. This is atoning. So the bull should be slaughtered before the Lord, that is in the temple. The anointed priest shall take some of the blood of the bull and bring it to the tent and meeting. The priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before the Lord in the curtain of the sanctuary. This blood is like cleaning stuff in some way. It's powerful. Blood, life blood is powerful in the ancient world. That's what you do uh, to, to undo sin. And then the priest shall take some of the blood and put it on the horns of the altar. So the altar, they have these four post altars, and it's basically a big barbecue grill. 
not, not kidding. You'd actually, you know, burn meat there, right? So they'd have charcoal underneath, and they'd have, uh, you know, a grate. You put the meat on it, and you burn it. But then the priest takes some of the blood and puts it on these horns of the altar. This is the way ancient Israelites understand sin, is that sin is not just about you. It does weigh on you when you sin, but it doesn't just weigh on you. It weighs on everybody, and it weighs on God. And so when you sin, it's almost like uh, it, it, some of it flies to the altar, and sticks onto the horns of the altar, almost like the portrait of Dorian Gray or something like that. You know, like the sins of Dorian Gray kind of stick to the portrait. Well, this is like that portrait. And the more sins that people commit, that is the worse they treat each other, the more stuff, gunk, builds up on the horns of this altar, and the more you have to like clean it with spiritual cleansing stuff, which is the blood of animals. Now, what do you do with these animals? Well, you cook them. And then you have a feast. And the people that you've offended get to come to the feast. And the priests get to share in it too. This is also, by the way, how the priests eat and their families. <laughs> so uh, this is this is the system of like actual feasting that goes after. So why would you have a feast with the people that you've offended? Hmm. What's that? You're, you're bringing friends together. You're, you're, you have to be in community with each other. You have to be in community with each other. You break bread with your guys. This requires the person to repent who's done the thing that's been wrong and to try to make public restitution for it. So you, make, you repent, you make public restitution, then you have this ritual of atoning, and then you have to sit down with the people who have offended you, and you've offended or whatever, and you have to share food together that the person who has offended has provided, right? <laughs> out of their, out of their. Uh, so anyway, this, you, this, there's different versions of this ritual, one for just the regular person. If you want to see where you fit in this, you're in chapter four, verse 27. Um, any of the ordinary people, that's us. Um, so no, no nobles here, right? Um, so in any event, uh, uh, this, this is the system for getting, like sort of atoning for sin. And you can see how it's like symbolic in the sense of like animal blood. It's also like material in the sense that like it has to do with stuff and food and people saying I'm sorry. So this is a way of negotiating, renegotiating relationships that have been broken. And this is a way to think about sin. This is, this is the, the procedure for it. Um, you can see that like, you know, there's probably many different ways we want to deal with it today. Um, but this is still a pretty, I think, decent way of thinking about how to repair and restore a community that's been broken. So, uh, in any event, uh, the prophets of, the, of, the, of ancient Israel uh, realized that uh, lots of people do these rituals, but don't actually care about them, especially the powerful. <laughs> the kings do these rituals a lot, and uh, they, like, they love to sacrifice lots of animals, but um, they don't actually want to change anything. This is why you get prophets like Amos, like Hosea, like Isaiah, who start to yell, like Micah, start to yell at the kings, at the nobles, at the elite, and so on, who go through these ritual, public rituals a lot, but they do it so that they can sin more. So this is a really kind of common problem in the ancient world and the modern world of people trying to like go through atoning rituals so that they can kind of uh, get back to get back to sinning. Um, let me read to you, you don't have to turn to this, but let me just read to you a bit of uh, Micah here. Um, you may have uh, heard this, this passage, but I'm going to explain it to you in a slightly different way than you might have heard it before. Um, so Micah chapter 6. So God says, hear what the Lord says, rise, plead your case. I won't read this whole part, this is chapter 6 verse 1. God has a controversy with the people. God will contend with Israel. This is lawsuit language. God is suing Israel. Oh, people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent you Moses and so on and so on. I sent you saving acts. And in the rest of the book of Micah, we can see that the big problem is that the people who have power in ancient Israel have started to use people as objects started to kind of crush them with burdens of taxation, but also with burdens of forced labor. And basically Israel's turned into Egypt and Pharaoh. Like there's an oppressive, oppressive structure in ancient Israel, um, in which it's replicating some of the nations around it, right? These kind of oppressive structures of power and their own, they're enslaving their own people. And Micah and Amos and Hosea and Isaiah, all of them are very angry about this precise issue. This is the lawsuit. You're not treating your people nicely, right? Well, you're, this is sin. This is this disorder that's that's crept into the relationships that structure in your very society. And so the response of the people is verse six. Uh, with what shall I come before Yahweh and bow myself to God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, for my sin, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What are the people trying to do? God says, I have a lawsuit against you because you've been treating your own people in a corrupt 
terrible, oppressive way. And the people say, how much do you want to sacrifice? What do you call that? Settling out of court. A bribe, yeah, settling out of court, right. Yeah, the people want to, so this is how many people are treating this system. The system itself is good, but the people are treating it as a way to get around changing. So then the response from the prophet to the people who are trying to you know, plea bargain God and get out of any problem, God has told you, O oh mortal, what is good and what did the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So God really wants this transformation to happen. And the liturgy of sin and atonement is understood to be a moment of preparing someone and helping them undergo actual transformation. Where it doesn't happen, sin remains, it's still a problem. And God desires the justice and mercy uh, that, that structure the society. The, the idea of justice, by the way, and righteousness, sorry, I'm going too long with all this and we'll have to do the New Testament in 10 minutes, but anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Uh, but uh, the, the, the issue, uh, I mean, justice and righteousness are treated as uh, synonyms in the Old Testament. They're actually two different concepts that are just paired because they cover two different kind of related territories. Justice, mishpat in ancient Hebrew, ancient, uh, Hebrew and, and the Israelite system of concepts. Uh, justice is a big issue, structure, big structures of society issue. Um, we would think about like uh, systemic problems in our society like racism. That's a justice issue in the Old Testament, right? A systemic, uh, it's not any one person who's doing this thing. Well, there are people, individuals making choices, but the bigger issue is this thing that really goes beyond my choices of what I want to do. It's a whole uh, order of our life. That's Justice or injustice in the Bible deals with those big order concepts. Righteousness is more about what I do. What choices do I make? Am I, am I being righteous or not? With, I can be righteous in an unjust system. I can be righteous in a just system, right? There can be a just system with unrighteous people in it and so on. So uh, those are two related but slightly different questions. And they're both questions that deal with this problem of sin. And as we'll see, uh, maybe part of your home, homework, if you want it, will be to read uh, part of Romans that we will we'll gloss over a bit. But, but this issue of Big picture sin and little picture sin, that is me and what I do, but also the, the, the society, um, those are both in view in the New Testament. Okay, so in the New Testament, we do read about demons, and we read about the devil. This is a big part of how evil and sin works in the New Testament. So in the intervening centuries between the stuff that, we, that makes up the Old Testament and the stuff that makes up the New Testament, there was a development in ancient Jewish thought. And that development was that they, they got past the point where they were not being tempted to worship the, the sort of demon powers of ancient Mesopotamia, right? Um, they, they understood the concept of monotheism, but then there was a problem that came along after that. Okay, so they're not tempted to like think that the Akitu rituals are real in Babylon or whatever, but the bigger problem is, does God do all the bad stuff in the world then? Is God responsible for all this stuff? Where does the evil come from that we, we can't pin on any human heart? So the problem is that over time they start to realize that evil in the world is not just equal to the exact amount of evil added up in every single human heart, but there's some other stuff too, stuff out there, structures of evil in the world that undergird, and, 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 and there's inexplicable evil even. Why does this person, I think of psychopaths or something, why does this person do this? It's not even just like in their heart or something, it's like this emergence of disorder in the world in a way that we can't control, we can't explain. And this is where uh, uh, ancient Jewish theologians start to reclaim some of those very ancient concepts for them of, of the demonic, the evil powers of the world. So again, this is an evolution of thought, but by the time of Jesus, this is pretty common in, in ancient Jewish thought. Um, uh, and, and so Jesus participates in the same culture of talking about evil, systemic evil, in a way, in, in embodying it in the sense of the devil, demons, and so on, evil powers, evil spirits. Um, this is a way of, again, getting at these kind of bigger powers or bigger picture. Um, Jesus himself uh, uh, talks about uh, freeing people from this power. The forgiveness of sins uh, is thrown around a lot in the Gospels. And it doesn't always mean, sometimes it means, but it doesn't always mean just saying like, okay, the five things you did today, Paul, like you don't have to worry about that, God's okay with those, or whatever. Um, they're often bigger picture, like the, the forgiveness of sins is a big, big picture thing that Jesus is coming here to do to us or for us. And there's, in some way, it, it has to work to do with all people, all things. And it's really a struggle between Jesus and the powers of evil that's, on the, on the, that's in, it's in view. And the initial kind of uh, uh, individual miracles that Jesus does, um, Jesus isn't supposed to go around and heal every single person in the world. Those initial miracles are signs that a new order is coming. So in other words, it's a, it's a picture of like what is going to happen. 
and Jesus' death and resurrection is understood as a, a symbol of this sign or this power that Jesus has. That's um, the emergence of an old power in a new way is the way that the Gospels would talk about it. It's not that Jesus does something that's never been done before, the forgiveness of sins. It's that Jesus is a new way for new groups of people uh, who have been excluded from even the system of atonement and so on to be included uh, and to be uh, uh, filled with the power uh, that, that, that the forgiveness of sins brings. So there's a new way of life that Jesus is inaugurating that really is the old way of life, uh, just sort of a, a new avenue to it, a new way to it. Jesus is often called the friend of sinners as well. When the sin, sin shows up in the Gospels, if you just look up just sin by itself, it doesn't show up in the Gospels much, but sinners do, it does, uh, and sins, that is, like all collective sins, shows up a whole lot too. Jesus was understood as a friend of sinners, especially, which two groups? The tax collectors the and the prostitutes, right, yeah. So uh, in the, in the ancient uh, uh, Greco-Roman world, uh, tax collectors, there were two different types of tax collectors, unfortunately often referred to by the same uh, noun, the tax collector. Um, there were rich tax collectors who ran tax collecting firms. Zacchaeus is one of these guys. They have power, they have money, they have the ability to choose whether or not they're gonna do what they're gonna do. How, how extractive are they gonna be? That's up to them. There's also the tax collectors that are like the thugs that are sent in to collect taxes. They don't get to choose what they're doing because almost all of them are slaves. They're slaves who are strong, oftentimes depicted in comedies of the time, Greco-Roman comedies, as being like buffoons, like st stupid, so stupid they can't get a job doing anything else, but they end up getting uh, uh, employed as thugs. Um, so these are people who have to go into people's homes every day and take as much as they possibly can and leave, uh, and then give it all to their masters, and then they go home to their poor little hovels. So these are folks who don't get a choice about what to do. And when Jesus eats with tax collectors, this seems to be these slave tax collectors, these folks who are sinners in the sense that they're doing bad things all the time, the people who are trapped in a systemic cycle of sin over which they have no power. Prostitutes are the same thing in the ancient world. In ancient Israel, prostitutes are slaves. These are women who've been sold into debt slavery by their families because the Roman system of, of slavery, like Romans develop an entirely new way of thinking about slavery. Um, it was awful before, it becomes weaponized in, in the Roman period. Um, uh, there were maybe a, uh, they, they, the system of taxation, debt collection, and so on was uh, designed to enslave a good portion of the people. That was how the Roman economy grew, was by more and more slaves. It's kind of like the U.S. So South. Familiar. So familiar. Um, by the time of Jesus, it's estimated that one third of women in Palestine, um, of between the ages of like 15 and 30 or so on, uh, were, were prostitutes. That is not like selling themselves and keeping profits. They were enslaved. They were sex slaves. So this, this is a tremendous problem within Jesus' time. And when Jesus meets with these prostitutes, these women who are sold into sex slavery, he doesn't tell them, go and sin no more. He does say that to adulterers, people who have their own ability to make choices and are not slaves and so on. Like the woman uh, you know, at the well, go and sin, uh, the you know, woman caught in the act of adultery, go and sin no more. You know, this hurt people made choices that hurt their own lives and hurt their relationships with others and so on. But to people who don't have agency over this, Jesus says, never says, you're, you're a sinner. Jesus is the friend of these sinners, these people who are trapped in these cycles and are doing things that are bad, but like, have no, have no agency. So this is again, Jesus trying to interrupt and disrupt that systemic cycle of destruction. And the ultimate act of disruption of this systemic problem of sin is presented as the, the cross. What happens at the cross is that there is something that almost like, uh, uh, it's a spoke in the wheel is what you want to, Bonhoeffer talks about it, right? You know, uh, it, there's this cycle of sin uh, that uh, kind of comes out of the human, the human being, like the way that we exist in the world now after uh, this development um, uh, of, of the possibility of humans knowing good and evil. That means we can do evil, we can choose evil. Uh, this, this kind of Jesus choosing to be this, perfect uh, uh, person choosing to be the one that is then the sacrifice, the one who is the atoning agent. And there's a lot of Christian theologies that have to do with this that like, uh, that some are in my mind more destructive, some are uh, less destructive. But the thing that these all share is that there's something to this act of Jesus' death that does something to sin. There's some effect. It, it destroys in some way the powers of sin that are tied up also with death. That we see even in Genesis 3, right? This uh, uh, notion that the tree of good and evil also is connected to like humans being barred from the tree of, of life. 
there's some sort of death as a part of this. And we can see this uh, definitely in, in Paul. And in the last mm, two minutes of class, let's uh, turn to Romans, uh, Romans 5, if we can. And let me show you something that uh, might astound you. And that's that um, I don't think Paul would have agreed with many people who read Paul. Um, actually, so in light of time, let's turn, let's turn to Romans 3 in light of time. Okay. So the way Paul is often read is that people are evil because, like, Eve birthing people and the sex somehow, like, creates evil people or something. Like, we're all born into evil. Paul doesn't talk about it exactly that way. If you want to see Paul in Romans 5 through uh, 8, um, talks a lot about uh, how sin is a condition. It's a condition that we all kind of choose to be a part of. Um, so it's a, it's a slightly different way of thinking about it. But also the solution that many Christians think that Paul presents uh, is that, uh, you know, Christ dies. If you have faith in Christ, then you are saved. If you don't, too bad. You stay in sin. I think what Paul is talking about is a little bit more crazy than that. So if you turn with me to chapter 3 of Romans, verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. This is too much to get into now, but, but basically Paul's talking about the, the, the Jewish law, which he doesn't say it's bad. He just says it makes people, it's like, it's like the, the apple or the, the, the fruit, right? It allows you to know both good and evil. So once you know good and evil, now you know that you're trapped by evil. <laughs> so what do you do? So he says the law doesn't help you with that. So the righteousness of God. So now that we know that righteousness of God has been disclosed, this is also justice. This, in, in Greek, both those words are combined into diakosune. That's that whenever you see righteousness in Paul, it's both righteousness, individual, and justice, communal. It's, it's the whole picture. The God's justice, righteousness has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, if you have a little footnote, what does it say? Through the faith of Jesus Christ. Through the faith of Jesus Christ. This is what's called an objective genitive. The faith of Jesus. So, if I say, like, I, the, the faith of my children, I could mean faith in my children, or my children have faith in me. Subjective or objective genitive. Right? Mm -hmm. Like Brennan of Decatur. Or, you know, so, like, you can, like, kind of read those genitives in different ways uh, whenever the word of is used. Uh, this is a question. It's not clear. Is it that you have to have faith in Jesus or is it that the righteousness of the faith of Jesus Christ for all? So, there is no distinction since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift. In other words, everyone does bad stuff. We know that, right? Through the redemption of Jesus, of, of Christ Jesus. So there's some sort of redemption, freeing. Redemption literally means to free someone from, from a condition, to free someone from sin. That God has put forth this sacrifice of atonement. If you have a little translational thing, a place of atonement, Jesus might be not just the sacrifice of atonement, but the word in Greek is actually the place of atonement. Jesus is the space where atonement happens. <clears throat> By his blood affected through faith, he did this to show his righteousness, his justice, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. So Jesus hasn't been mad at anyone's sin ever. Has passed over them and now is giving us space for atonement. Why? It was to prove at the present time that he himself, Jesus, is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus or who has the faith of Jesus, who Jesus has faith in. And then Paul at the very end of Romans 9 through 11 where he deals with the issue of like, what, what is, how do Christians relate to Jews? He says, well, kind of everyone's going to be saved at some point. This is a real discussion within Christian theology. I don't want to say everyone agrees with me here, but just to say that uh, uh, there are two different ways of reading Paul and of reading the way that the salvation is discussed in the Gospels and in, and, in, uh, um, and in Paul. And here we see this kind of objective subjective genitive problem like, uh, is it that we, I, I really think Paul is saying like, none of us are going to like make good choices. We're all gonna make bad choices. Not all our choices we make are gonna be bad. This is in full depravity and so on. But all of us are gonna mess things up. But thank God that God has worked through Jesus Christ to provide a space for atonement that is open to all. That's a big part of the letter of the Romans. Like I can't like go through the Jewish rituals of atonement because I'm not Jewish. But anyone can go through the atonement ritual, the, the way, the spa, have that space of atonement that Jesus provides. It's open to all, to Gentiles and Jews alike. So in any event, that's, that's at least what the New Testament has to say uh, about, about sin in very brief and miniature. Um, and uh, sorry, I didn't, you know, whatever, didn't give due to the Gospels. But we'll 
we'll get there. Uh, all right, next week, uh, Shirley will talk to us about uh, the early church and how it deals with the question of sin.